Literally since the beginning of Pokemon's existence, it's been surrounded in controversy. No matter what Pokemon tries to do, whenever there's a new release, whenever anything Pokemon related gets popular, there's controversy around it. So let's talk about some of the wildest ones and some of the obscure ones you've maybe never heard of, or you might like vaguely remember. There's some crazy ones we have to talk about here. Let's start talking about some of the remakes of Pokemon because those games actually had some very interesting censorship that at first the Pokemon company got criticism for, but when people looked into the law that tied the Pokemon company's hands together, we realized that they didn't really have a choice here. Yes, we're talking about the good old fashioned game corner from the earliest Pokemon games. If you don't remember, in the first four generations of Pokemon, all the way back in the day, there was a little area called a game corner, which essentially was like a little gambling casino where you could go in there and, you know, play slots. You could spend your in-game money on coins that you could then gamble to make more coins, and then you could cash them out and get really cool prizes like rare Pokemon, and they were pretty fun. But people started to notice in 2010 when Heart Gold and Soul Silver released that things were maybe changing. The game corner in Heart Gold and Soul Silver that was originally in Goldenrod City was actually switched out. No longer could you play slots. Instead, there was a game called Voltorb Flip. At first, some Pokemon fans assumed that this switch was because of maybe parents being upset that there was gambling in games, but that actually wasn't the origin of all of this. As it actually turned out, in Europe, the Peggy game rating system actually upped their strictness against any game that includes anything that could encourage, promote, or teach gambling that doesn't have an 18 plus rating. Now very obviously Nintendo isn't going to change the rating for their entire European release to make the Pokemon games like Peggy 18, so instead they had to find a way to phase out all of the gambling related mentions from each game. In some cases they made the games just unplayable, but in games like Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, fire, the game corner is just straight up closed. Just buy. It even looked like Diamond and Pearl back in the day, those 4th gen games that did have a game corner, just they weren't playable. And this would happen again when like Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee revisited Kanto. Once again, the slot machines aren't playable there. You know, as a kid, I really did enjoy those little mini games. It was something to get away from like the main gameplay and do something different. I understand why maybe encouraging kids to gamble isn't the best thing. But then again, loot boxes exist in a lot of games still. Nonetheless, I can understand why fans of the older games jump jumping into remakes to find that like the game corner was gone was controversial, but it definitely wasn't like an explosive backlash like some of the things we're gonna talk about today. I just wanted to ease us in with a little interesting one. Okay, real quick before we jump into it, we don't have a sponsor today, so instead, I just wanna plug Gamersubs, who has been working with our other channel, Rocket Slock, for years now, but we wanted to kind of extend things over here too. But yeah, Gamersubs is awesome. You just add this to your water and boom, instant energy drink that has really good flavor, like seriously good flavor. I drink this stuff all the time. It's sugar free, but it has caffeine also, so you'll be awake and ready to go at any time. Actually, I stopped drinking sodas and energy drinks and started drinking gamer subs more regularly because I like the taste better. And trust me, I swear by Arctic Cooler, it recently became my favorite flavor and I'll die for it. Not really, but you know what I mean. But yeah, gamer subs gives us a very generous share every time someone purchases using our link or code rocket sloth. So it's a great way to support the channel if you like our content, but also get something cool. They some really cool shaker cups, including these waifu cups that include these over-the-top anime characters on them. <laughs> My wife's a huge fan of the collection that we've acquired. Listen, wouldn't this look great in your own collection? Or maybe you got a special someone that you need to buy a waifu cup for just to tell them, you know, hey, I get you. Okay, where am I going with this? Because we're officially launching this on Rocket Elijah now and sharing our link here, the guys over at Gamersups also gave us some gift cards to give out. So first five people, bam, here are the codes, go nuts, be quick, first come, first serve. Okay, let's get back to the video. Let's talk about whether or not Pokemon is satanic. This one surprisingly was massive in the 90s. Like I remember this one vividly and every once in a while some like crazy person comes around claiming the same things that were said back in the 90s. But uh, let's be real, the 90s though was very different. People were much more impressionable of like Pokemon because it was a new thing. People weren't used to it being around as much back then and parents were concerned. I mean, just like look at this television broadcast here. I think this started this huge trend of Pokemon in the West just being very heavily scrutinized. I mean, so much of the early things that Pokemon was doing ended up being deemed controversial and there was a lot of things that ended up getting censored or changed over the first couple of years of Pokemon. But the satanic side of things, I don't know if 
there's really any truth behind the claims, but I know a lot of people believe them to be true. Matter of fact, my best friend in elementary school straight up was not allowed to play Pokemon, wasn't allowed to watch a show, nothing regarding Pokemon was allowed in his household. His parents were super religious, and since Pokemon teaches themes of evolution, which goes against what their family had as a belief system, and you know, all these other claims of Pokemon promoting gambling, because there's trading cards and you can battle for cards, I guess, if you wanted to gamble them as stakes on the line. I don't know the full understanding, I don't get it, but what I do get is that my friend in elementary school still loved Pokemon. He would secretly watch it on TV when his parents weren't home. I let him borrow my Pokemon Fire Red game and we took the label off so they could never figure it out. He got caught later. And you know what? To this day, I think he still likes Pokemon. Okay, then I had another friend though whose older brother was more into Pokemon than he was because he was pretty young at the time when Pokemon first came out and that huge Pokemon mania, Pokemania thing was going around. And he remembers coming home one night and his brother had like a very serious tone. And I guess he heard about like the satanic claims and the evil that was in Pokemon at like church or something and decided that they were going to have a burning of the Pokemon cards. And they burned all of their Pokemon cards in the 90s. I assume there was some rare Pokemon cards there if this was like right at the very beginning of Pokemon hype. They just burned them. So yeah, a lot of us firsthand probably didn't experience like the Pokemon being evil trend. But if you were in the right friend groups, I guess, I don't know who my friends were back in elementary school, who had parents who were like super religious and like maybe not as informed of, you know, what the show really was about or the games were really about. They might just take something at word. And uh, yeah, Pokemon definitely had a really bad rap publicly during the first couple of years because there were these like radical people on television talking about the evils of Pokemon. Tie that together that because Pokemon was popular, it was a little bit of a distraction in school. You know, people looking at cards, trading cards at lunch, maybe some kids getting scammed at lunch. A lot of schools were also banning Pokemon for those reasons. But like when you hear like two different things, like, oh, Pokemon's the devil and oh, Pokemon's not banned at school. I don't know. If you're not an informed parent, you might think like, eh, maybe, maybe we'll just not let you play Pokemon. You know, this was before like the internet was in every household. Rumors on the playground would run wild. And one of the biggest Pokemon rumors that a lot of people still believe, and honestly, it, it baffles my mind that people believe this one, is the whole Lavender Town Syndrome. Before this channel blew up, we did a whole video looking into the Lavender Town Syndrome. It got like no views, and it's very interesting. We looked into like the lore of possibly what inspired the song that was played in Lavender Town. But of course, there's like the internet rumors that this song in the early releases of the game was at a frequency that made kids want to hurt themselves. And because of that controversy, the Pokemon company ended up having to pitch the song down for later releases of the game. There is no actual truth to this. No reports of any injuries from Pokemon Lavender Town, but it just became a big urban legend. And it's one that a lot of people still believe to this day. But on the flip side, there was one thing that surprisingly did actually happen that you could believe was an urban legend if there wasn't like actual, you know, news reports discussing what happened. And that's of course the whole Porygon incident. This ended up turning into two separate controversies, which is interesting, but let's just talk about like Porygon originally. In the Japanese anime of the Pokemon TV show, there was an episode that featured Porygon and all of the characters like go into the virtual world. And while they're in the virtual world, Pikachu lets off an electric shock. And in the animation, there's an explosion that has like red and blue lights flickering super quickly. This ended up triggering an epileptic seizure in about five to 600 kids who were watching the show the night that it aired. And many of the kids were hospitalized. Now it doesn't look like there was any long-term injuries regarding the epileptic incident that happened, but it did cause Pokemon to go off the air for a while. And all the episodes were revised to slow down some of the lighting effects that were used for action sequences like that. It caused some episodes to air out of order. And that episode itself that caused the incident would forever be banned and would never air again on television. And it would never get a dub released in the West. The big effect of that though was Porygon himself would, as a Pokemon, never really appear in the anime other than very, very small appearances occasionally in like different contexts, but never like a feature section for a long time, for like decades. And you know what? Porygon kind of got a bad rap for it because really it was Pikachu who caused the explosion. Porygon was just the featured Pokemon in the episode. And then that sentiment of, you know, Porygon getting punished for something he didn't even do became like a meme in the community. And the Pokemon Twitter account itself decided to jump on that meme tweeting out at one point a couple of years ago, Porygon did nothing wrong. A funny sentiment in itself until you realize where the like blank did nothing wrong meme originated from. It's something you don't really think about nowadays, but yeah, 
Now the blank did nothing wrong meme does originate from like a, you know, a super evil German dictator from the 1940s, which just like opens up a whole nother can of worms because now all of a sudden Porygon is being compared to, well, that guy. Nintendo ended up removing the tweet and um, I guess it makes sense why. I don't think they intended for those comparisons to be drawn, but um, it, was, it, was, it was just a joke. I don't know. Okay, there were some other interesting controversies. A lot of these are like very common knowledge. We won't spend a lot of time on them. Like, you know, Jinx originally being depicted potentially in blackface. That was kind of controversial. And um, after some articles were published, the Pokemon would be redesigned to have a purple face. And interestingly enough, when Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow were re-released on the 3DS eShop, they actually added in an extra color palette that wasn't available in the original Game Boy releases of the game to allow for the color purple that they needed for Jinx, which is really technologically interesting, I guess. There were some other little censorship things that happened over the years, like Misty's Pokemon card being censored from the Japanese version to the English version because it alluded to potentially Misty being naked in the card. There was this card that also was censored for having these symbols, which are very commonplace in like Buddhist culture. But when people in the West see it, they just think of those German Beyblades that were like really common in 1940s that we don't want to say in the video. And honestly, these ones are just like the tip of the iceberg of like small controversies, but there are some bigger ones that, oh boy. Okay, we need to talk about the Uri Geller story now. This dude is like a famous illusionist magician type guy, I guess. And in the late 1990s, he was incredibly popular in Japan. So lo and behold, when Pokemon releases and there's 151 Pokemon, the Pokemon Kadabra may have drawn some pretty big inspiration from Uri Geller. And apparently Geller himself wasn't too happy about this. Nintendo and Pokemon never reached out to him. So he kind of went public with it, talking about how they turned him into an evil occult member. Now, mind you, Kadabra really only shows up in like that one Pokemon episode with Sabrina and he is pretty menacing. And from there, Uri Geller chose to file a lawsuit against the Pokemon company for using his likeness without his permission. And the lawsuit ended up getting dropped just a couple of years later. However, it is speculated that beyond the original run of those base Pokemon cards, Kadabra has only appeared a very limited number of times and maybe out of fear of another lawsuit. That part is purely speculation. However, all these years later, Uri Geller has actually changed his opinion on the matter and now fully embraces his likeness being used as Kadabra. He's even posted a random unexpected apology onto Twitter saying that he loves Kadabra in hopes that the Pokemon trading card games end up using Kadabra again in the future, which they would end up doing as like a special like anniversary of the original run of the cards. So yeah, kind of an interesting thing. His big gimmick obviously was like the spoon bending, which obviously like Kadabra and Alakazam are known for. So while whether or not Pokemon actually drew inspiration from him, uh, that's up for debate. But despite the controversy it caused back at the early days, it seems like this one kind of ended off on a rather positive note. Okay, there was also some goofy controversies over the years that probably didn't have too much to stand on, like the Pokemon rap. That's an awesome song. If you play it backwards, apparently it says all hail Satan. What? <laughs> yeah, this is some true thing that some people actually believed. So let's just like play it back. There's a YouTube video of it already. Okay, you know what? Let's just move on to the next one. I don't know. Maybe there, <laughs> maybe there is something there. I think it's just, you know, the whole imposing your ideas onto what you're hearing type thing, not actually it playing it back, but I digress. Let's move on. You know, Pokemon Go has had a lot of criticism over the years just for various little things here and there. Like for instance, Pokemon Go had a special season recently called Adventures Abound, and they released this artwork alongside it. And people were looking at it like, is, is that AI art? We don't have to go into all the details why there's backlash surrounding AI art use in general, but yeah, there was some criticism and accusations towards Pokemon Go for potentially using AI art as this background image to just pop those Pokemon on top of it. Now, there hasn't been any proof that it is in fact AI art, but there also isn't proof that it's not AI art. To be fair, when you look closely at some of the objects in the background, they don't look like anything, so I don't know. <laughs> I feel like they maybe did use, you know, AR. It was just a promotional image to be fair, but yeah, I can see why there's some criticisms. I mean, I'm sure some artists out there would have loved to be commissioned to just draw like a little cityscape that they could slap their Pokemon on, but uh, they used like some free tool maybe? I don't know for certain. I'm gonna stay out of the AI art debate. Also in Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum in Asia, Registeel looks like this. However, in the West, where they updated his design to not look like this because they probably wanted to avoid people drawing the comparison to a certain uh, German dictator from the 1940s that we're not gonna say his name. How does this keep coming up? When Pokemon Home was released, they accidentally used the old original Japanese version of the sprite, but later updated it to change it out again. So it did become relevant one more time. When Pokemon Unite released, 
We're not gonna talk about this one for too long because it's a silly controversy, I guess. There was a lot of uh, questionable decisions made around the game when uh, there were microtransactions that allowed you to get like item boosters or something that would make your power-ups better and stronger. It kind of made the game a little bit pay to win, but we've also talked about this in our Pokemon apps video that really like long-term it doesn't affect too much of the outcome of the game because you can just level up them normally. When you get to the higher tier competitive side of the game, everyone already has their items and stuff like maxed out already. So it doesn't really matter. It's more just like getting a head start at the early stages of the game, but still kind of weird to put something that gives you a little bit of a performance boost for a real monetary value in a game like this that's supposed to be competitively focused. But Pokemon Unite, kind of a niche game nowadays. It's not as big of a deal. It's not worth like really getting hung up on. Okay, so most of us probably already know about the quote unquote Dexit controversy. If you don't know what that is, it was when Pokemon Sword and Shield came out. It turned out that not all of the Pokemon from the entire game franchise would be included. This was pretty disappointing for a lot of fans because it was the first time ever that like Pokemon that were in previous games and generations were not in the new game and you couldn't transfer your old Pokemon into the new game. And it's still kind of a controversy that's talked about a lot, but I don't want to like, you know, just talk about this one forever. I do hope we get to a point where eventually just every Pokemon can be in the game. I feel like the Pokemon games in general have been kind of controversial for not having the quality that a lot of fans expect. I mean, Scarlet and Violet released in a little bit of a rough state performance wise. I mean, there was some weird glitches when I loaded up the game, all these students were randomly T-posing. It was a whole thing. And even after the public outcry of the state that Scarlet and Violet was in, the Pokemon team even acknowledged the state and almost apologized saying that they were gonna fix the game up. So maybe moving forward after enough backlash, it feeling like a lot of these Pokemon games are rushed, has at least been acknowledged by the Pokemon company. Maybe moving forward, things are gonna look solid, hopefully. I mean, there was the whole thing that happened with Pokemon Shining Diamond and Brilliant Pearl, wait. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Jeez, I don't know what I'm talking about. Did I, did I get it right? You know, I know the art style wasn't what a lot of fans wanted. That's fine. I can get used to like the chibi art style, but straight up when this game released, it was pretty evident that this game wasn't given the same attention and remake quality and focus that some of the other remakes in previous years had had. There were glitches from the old game that still worked in this new game because it just was a port of the game scripting. And while not everyone hated these remakes, there was still enough of of a consensus that this Pokemon game didn't have the attention that it deserved. And it kind of contributed to the overall more recent discussion as to whether or not Game Freak is like cutting corners with the Pokemon franchise, which I think a lot of people really do think that that is what's going on. And that's been an ongoing controversy, probably one of the biggest ongoing controversies that the Pokemon company has faced. And they're definitely dealing now with the aftermath and backlash of not only game fatigue as they've been releasing a lot of Pokemon games and TLCs, but when the quality also dips, it just gets more frustrating as a long-term Pokemon fan. Okay, this next one's actually based around a tragedy. In 1999, a seven-year-old boy passed away after choking on a Pokemon Power Bouncer, a bouncy ball item produced and distributed by Hasbro. The family, obviously grief-strucken, ended up building a website called PokemonKills.com. Now, since then, the domain is no longer active, though you can get it via Wayback Machine. In the post on the website, the events of what happened were recounted, but also an argument was made against Hasbro, stating that that had Hasbro complied with the Consumer Product Safety Commission guidelines and made the character in the ball larger, the tragedy could have been avoided. The family also went on to sue Hasbro and Toys R Us directly, which I believe was settled out of court, though I couldn't find like exact documentation proving this. And while a lot of the website is just talking about the item description and the call to ask Hasbro to discontinue the sales of the Pokemon Power Bouncer, the second half of the website turns into a strongly worded criticism about Pokemon itself. Also, calling for the boycott of Pokemon in the website, criticisms refer to multiple other controversies Pokemon had been involved in, such as the epileptic episode in Japan. It refers to the marketing and impact of the merchandising craze as the darker side of Pokemon, which is apparently greed. They criticize the incorrect grammar in the tagline of gotta catch them all. It suggests that Pokemon turns kids into obsessed and addicted merchandise hoarding fans. It calls out Pokemon for some of its merchandise being produced through the exploitation of cheap foreign labor. They also stated that McDonald's refused to collaborate with Pokemon, citing the questionable family values of Pokemon. And yeah, honestly, I, uh, I don't really know how I feel about this page. On one hand, I really want to feel like I understand the gravity and heartbreak that the family must have gone through. And if Hasbro did, in fact, went against consumer product 
Safety Commission guidelines, then yeah, they should have been held responsible. Though I have to say, Hasbro's response stated that nothing in their production line was against safety standards. Still, it was a terrible tragedy, but the Pokemon argument at the end of this does feel a little disconnected from the rest of the arguments, and even when the family made the lawsuit, they only sued Hasbro and Toys R Us, they didn't sue Pokemon from what I could tell. But unfortunately, this wasn't the only child-related death that Pokemon was accused of being responsible for. Some of you may actually remember this if you're around my age, but back in 1999 and 2000, Burger King ran a promotion with Pokemon where you could get a Pokeball toy that had a little like Pokemon toy inside of the Pokeball. And this was like a massive promotion. So much so that there were shortages where Burger King had to run an ad apologizing for the shortages of the toys. But shortly after this campaign began, tragedy would strike when two children over the course of a two week period would pass away after suffocating on a part of the Pokeball toy. Burger King ceased to distribute the Pokeballs moving forward and worked on a recall campaign. Burger King issued a statement that parents should take away containers from children ages three and younger and should either be thrown away or returned to Burger King and they'll get a free small order of french fries. However, despite these efforts to gain the attention of those who had received these Pokeballs, a third child, a four month old boy, passed away a month after these deaths were reported. After this, both Burger King and Pokemon received a ton of backlash. Burger King was hit with multiple lawsuits, which I do believe reached a undisclosed settlement. This was actually pretty big news and ended up resulting in many different Pokemon partners reevaluating how some merchandise was made. And also, according to the Miami Herald, Burger King would go on to improve their testing procedures, hiring a human factors psychologist to look at upcoming toys and how children will interact with them. <sighs> what a heavy topic. You know what? Let's, let's just like shift gears a little bit. There's some other smaller banned Pokemon episodes that are kind of worth mentioning. We won't go into every banned episode, but just some of the big ones that are kind of interesting. You might know some of these. There was the episode Beauty and the Beach, where uh, James has some uh, interesting stuff going on in a bodysuit. We'll just censor that on the screen. This episode would get edited down and released in some weird format that was just like not normal for an episode and with all the weird stuff cut out. There was the episode where Ash caught the 30 Tauros that we never saw the episode to because it never came to the West. It was because the Safari Zone warden kept using a gun and pointing it at Ash and friends a few times. Oh, and Meowth dresses up as uh, that German dictator guy we don't want to say. Then there was a couple of Jinx episodes banned for all the controversies surrounding that Pokemon in itself. And then more recently, there was actually a Pokemon Sun and Moon episode that was banned because in this episode, Ash tries to look like the Pokemon Passimium. And Pokemon definitely wanted to avoid those, uh, you know, like racism allegations again. So they were not even going to let this one fly in the West. There's also been a little bit of controversy around the Pokemon black and white gym leader, Lenora. In general, since the Pokemon games are, of course, originating from Japan and made in Japan, things like race and ethnicity inclusion took longer for the Pokemon series to kind of kick into gear with. But by Pokemon black and white, we were starting to see some black characters introduced in the form of Lenora, who was a gym leader. However, her in-game sprites depict her wearing a large apron, and she had an apron tied around her hair. In the US, there is a historical stereotype when stuff like this is brought up in a modern day, which dates back to the Jim Crow era, where enslaved black women would often become a caretaker in a household, which then was turned into this mammy stereotype where this narrative of black women being happy within slavery as they have this role of servitude and would go on to become this caricature in a lot of different representations, which severely undermines the atrocities that these people went through. It's similar to the conversation around Aunt Jemima, the syrup brand, where a few years ago, the decision was made to overhaul the brand in order to quote, make progress towards racial equity. Whether the designers at Pokemon made this decision to make the character resemble this stereotype or not is completely unknown. It could have been a coincidence, it could have been an accident, but after the games released both in Japan and the West with this character model, the content was already put out there and discussions would already begin online. Ultimately though, moving forward for all future appearances of this character in the West, the character would be redesigned in some way or another. In the anime, they actually changed the way the character looked from the Japanese version into the Western releases to remove the apron, which, you know, kind of went along with the stereotype. And then in later iterations of the character's appearances, like in a Pokemon special or in Pokemon Masters EX, for example, the character's clothing had been changed and we probably won't see this character reverting back to the old clothing options from before. Okay, there were some other Pokemon Go controversies that are worth mentioning 
mentioning that really caused some negative feedback for Pokemon Go, and the fan community was really upset about it. Pokemon Go Fest 2017 was a big disaster. Right after the huge hype of Pokemon Go, there was a big event planned that would bring Pokemon Go fans from around the world together to have some really cool experience right there in one single place. However, it seemed like the planning that went into the Pokemon Go Fest wasn't really that fleshed out or well done all that much. It seems like there were a lot of issues at this first ever Pokemon Go Fest. Apparently, many of the people who went to the event were unable to even log into the game, which was really frustrating due to like server overload and there was like spotty internet connections at the event themselves. Apparently, since there were so many people in one specific location, the server load of Niantic wasn't ready for this. And then the communication from Niantic was like very slow and was pretty vague in what was going on for the attendees, which caused a lot of people to be confused with what was going on. And it was just frustrating all around. They offered partial refunds for some of the attendees, which was confusing. And then there was like gift rewards for some of the attendees. And this long story short ended up going down as a disaster that kind of chipped away at the player trust with Niantic and Pokemon Go. Many people felt like they were let down by the way that this whole event was handled. And anytime a new event was planned for the future, fans are definitely skeptical as to whether or not Niantic would be able to pull it off. In more recent years, Niantic's reputation has only gotten much worse. Over the last few years, there's been a lot of controversy on the way that Niantic has handled things like remote play during like lockdowns and whatnot, and like removing features that allowed for this too early. But more recently, there's been a big trend under the hashtag hear us Niantic that criticized a more recent decision to limit remote raids to five passes per day, which not only made it more difficult for people who lived in rural areas or people with maybe disabilities who can't physically go outside and play the game, or even people who don't have the time to spare to go out and participate, but also there was a giant price hike associated with the passes, and it just felt very tone deaf considering the state that a lot of the other features and the track record that Niantic had with Pokemon Go was over the last few years. This Hear Us Niantic hashtag has been around for a little bit now, and it seems like every once in a while there's something new associated with some weird marketing decision or weird brand decision that Pokemon Go chooses to do that seems to negatively impact their game, and a lot of the time the fan base just doesn't feel like their voices are heard or how they're feeling about certain changes are even being considered by the company, and they're just going to try to make the most money possible, obviously. There was also a really big controversy back in 2006 involving the Pokemon anime. During this time, about halfway through the Hoenn saga for Ash Ketchum, the Pokemon Company International took over production and distribution of the Pokemon anime, which meant that 4Kids Entertainment's overall involvement with the show would be ending. With that, it appeared that in order to try to balance the budget for transitioning the TV show to other stations for broadcast and to handle the production and dubbing of the Western releases of the show, the Pokemon Company opted for recasting many of the voice actors who were on the show for about 10 years at that point with new actors who would take on the roles for a lower cost. This not only sparked a lot of disappointment from long-term fans as all of a sudden their favorite characters sounded drastically different, but even Veronica Taylor, the voice of Ash Ketchum, spoke out about her disappointment in being replaced and her surprise of the decision that the Pokemon Company ended up making. And while Veronica Taylor was still graceful about her exit of the show, expressing gratitude for her time when she did get to voice the character and the opportunities it brought her, and she wouldn't like badmouth the Pokemon series, for long-term fans at that point, it was just a really unfortunate circumstance that just made watching the Pokemon show a lot harder to do because something always felt off. Of course, newer fans would come into the series later on as the show continued on, and the new voice cast was accepted, and they did a great job moving forward, but I think for this one, a lot of fans feel like the original cast was definitely done a bit dirty, especially with the first episode special featuring the new cast members was like the 10 year special with all those Mirage Pokemon, like a special that's made to celebrate the show's legacy was like the first instance of these new voice actors being here. Does it really surprise anyone that PETA's gotten mad at Pokemon over the years? Back during the release of Pokemon Black and White specifically, PETA had been more outspoken about Pokemon, making the argument that Pokemon promotes the idea of animals as objects that can be captured and confined and forced to battle for human entertainment. They essentially believed that Pokemon was a harmful message about the treatment of animals in the real world, so they went on to make their own Pokemon parody game called Pokemon Black and Blue, and I don't know, they like beat up Pokemon in it. This game of course got slammed very hard, but you also know that like hardcore PETA supporters definitely thought it was like the most clever, funniest, badass idea that PETA came up with to, you know, really stay edgy against a big corporation. Also, while we've talked earlier about the whole like Pokemon is satanic in Christianity, 
Christianity type discussion already, there was another ban imposed on Pokemon in countries like Egypt, where Pokemon based a temporary ban in Egypt in 2001, where this ban actually stemmed from concerns raised by religious leaders and parents regarding the content of the Pokemon franchise, mostly citing religious concerns, essentially claiming that the Pokemon franchise promoted things like polytheism, which is like belief in multiple gods and occultism. There were arguments made that some of the Pokemon specifically with their abilities and powers resembled mythical beings, which contradicted Islamic teachings. Some of the examples that were drawn from for criticism are kind of interesting too, like Meowth having the coin on his head was a big deal over there. There were apparently comparisons drawn from Meowth and his coin on his head to the traditional depiction of a Jewish folklore creature known as a golem. Then there were some questions in regards to Pokemon like Kadabra, a psychic Pokemon where some officials in Egypt thought that it was based off the Jewish mystic tradition of Kabbalah. They thought that the star shape on Jinx's forehead was supposed to be compared to the Star of David, which then spread into a lot of conspiracy theories, claiming that the creators of Pokemon intentionally included pro-Zionist or Jewish themes as a part of some hidden agenda. A lot of this was speculative and it was especially heightened by the fact that before Pokemon became popular in some of these countries like Egypt, it had already made its way to the West. So a lot of the people who were looking at Pokemon were actually looking at it through the scope of it coming from the West, as in like the United States and the scope that that show had been presented in, and not under the context that a lot of these characters were based off of Japanese culture, as the game and shows originate from Japan first. So fortunately enough, after more people became informed about the situation, a lot of the negative sentiment around Pokemon was lifted over time, and Pokemon was eventually reintroduced into Egypt. Back during the development of Pokemon Sword and Shield, there was some other controversy that not too many people remember, but the studio behind Pokemon Creatures Inc. posted onto social media that the team went and visited a shrine in Japan known as the Yasukuni Shrine, which actually sparked backlash and criticism from certain individuals and groups, specifically those outside of Japan but still in Asian countries. As many fans of Pokemon viewed the visit as insensitive and inappropriate because of the shrine's association with convicted war criminals and its contentious historical context. This controversy kind of accuses the employees of inadvertently, in a way, endorsing or supporting a site that symbolizes Japan's militaristic past and its actions during World War II. Just in general, because this shrine has like reverence for fallen soldiers, including some that are seriously awful war criminals, to some people living in countries that were occupied by Japan and their harsh and barbaric occupation in a lot of Asian countries during World War II kind of brought up this big debate about like historical interpretation and responsibility nowadays to be able to acknowledge wrongdoings done in the past. Ever since this incident happened though, it doesn't seem like Creatures Inc. has posted anything else similar to this since its occurrence a few years ago. Well, that was a lot to unpack for a video, but man, I think we got through all of the big points that I wanted to. This was a interesting video to say the least. If you enjoyed this video though, maybe make sure you subscribe with notifications on for more videos like this and all things Nintendo. I have a couple other cool videos you might like. We did a whole video on marketing disasters like this, but just on Nintendo games like a week or so ago. You guys can check that out on this channel, or you could check out the one we did on our other channel where we just talked about gaming as a whole. So there's like more content you can go and watch. If you're watching on TV though, make sure you are subscribed. The little extra click, I know it takes two more seconds, you have to find the remote, do whatever. It does help a lot though. So I really appreciate everyone who's done that. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time with a new video.